Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry to begin a minute or two late. The Zoom links, somehow the wires got crossed at some point. So if you're coming in a, a minute or two late, hopefully you're getting the right link quickly. Our apologies about that. Uh, so it is a pleasure to have Phil Harris here today to give our fourth iFi colloquium. Phil is a professor of physics at MIT. His PhD was on the first data from the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. As a postdoc, he played a leading role in the discovery of the Higgs boson, and as a staff scientist at CERN, he led the effort to search for dark matter at the CMS experiment at the LHC. As an MIT professor, Phil is working on deep learning strategies to measure the Higgs boson at dark matter, and he has helped build the fast machine learning community aimed at deploying real-time machine learning in the broader physics community. With that introduction, please join me in welcoming Professor Harris. There will be a Q&A session at the end during which you may ask questions in real time. Alternatively, feel free to submit questions at any point during the talk to be answered during the Q&A. Thanks a lot, and Phil, please uh, take it away. Thanks, um, and apologies for the quixotic title. Um, so this talk is gonna be split into two parts. Uh, I couldn't decide what I wanted to make this colloquium on. So I'm gonna split it into two hemispheres, uh, left brain where I'm gonna talk about fast machine learning and the right brain, I'm gonna talk about some uh, new ideas in anomaly detection. Um, and you might recall the left brain is kind of the logical uh, thought process and the right brain is the creative. Um, this is certainly like the, the old view of the brain. We subsequently learned that things are much more complicated and that's kind of the theme of this talk. So um, the first part is to left brain. So let's look at how we can think fast. So this talk uh, starts at the Large Hadron Collider. So here it is. Uh, and here's an airport where you can land A380s on. So just to give you a size of scale, right? So it's 25 kilometers in circumference. Um, and if you go to one of these points here and you go underground 100 meters, you have a large detector like this. There's uh, four big detectors at the LHC, um, kind of two multi-purpose um, high intensity detectors. This is one of them, this is CMS, the one I am a member of, I work on. And what do we do? Well, the detectors uh, have, let's say kind of four or main technologies and each technology is designed to reconstruct certain aspects of a collision. Uh, so you have an inner detector that you measure charged particles with, charged deposits and give you hits, you connect the dots, you get a track. Um, then you have these calorimeters. Uh, so the inner one, you can get electrons and photons, the outer ones, you can get hadrons. Um, and then you have these chambers on the outside or extending far out, and these are for identifying muons. Um, a typical collision looks like this, and a good LHC physicist would look at this and immediately know what's going on. Um, so you have two muons here, and you have two electrons here. Uh, and uh, uh, you would probably guess that this is from two Z bosons, and you would probably guess further that since it's in my talk, it's actually probably a Higgs boson, and that's it is. Now, the other thing to think about at the LHC is that we're colliding all the time. So a Higgs boson process only occurs in about one in a billion proton collisions. So you need to collide at a high rate and a high intensity to really see Higgs bosons. And so what does this mean? It means that we collide bunches of protons every 25 nanoseconds. Now, the detectors I'm talking about are large, they have many channels. So a typical vent is about eight megabits. And so if you collide at a rate of 40 megahertz, um, you're talking about uh, processing data at a total rate of 320 terabits per second. Um, to put this in scale, kind of the largest internet switches in the world are about eight uh, terabits per second. So this is say an order of magnitude more uh, in terms of data rate than kind of large data technology. Now, the other important thing to think about is that at the LHC these days, we don't collide just one uh, set of protons on each other. We tend to collide many cl protons at the same time. And so currently we have about 70 overlapping collisions, right? This just comes from the intensity of the bunches. Uh, and in the future, um, we're gonna have 200 overlapping collisions. We're continually upgrading the system and so we're gonna actually increase the intensity of the beam quite significantly in the next few years. So what does this mean? Well, what are we looking for? Well, these days, um, you know, we've discovered the Higgs boson and we're, now we're looking for kind of more subtle features in the data. We have a huge amount of data and we've done a lot of the kind of important measurements that you would do that are fairly easy. And I would say in general, 
broadly speaking, there's a transition to doing more complicated things. Uh, and here's an example. This is a, a result um, I, I developed and we put out you know, last year. So this is a high energy Higgs boson. And if you look, right, this left side here is a collection of many particles. This is a, a jet. Um, and if you look, you see there's two structures in here. And this turns out to be a, very likely a candidate for Higgs tank cane to be quarks. Um, you can see also there's another collection of energy that's a recoiling jet. Um, and so this is a like, typical process that we're looking for now. And the interesting thing about this process is that we were only really able to find this process with the help of deep learning. Um, and so in light of, let's say, all this data and in light of the LHC, um, deep learning has made a, played a very important role in the development of analyses in the LHC in the past few years. Um, and we've tried to follow kind of the trends um, in the deep learning world. So in 2016, where CN when CNNs were all the rage, um, we took our collections of particles and we made images and we had so-called jet images. Um, but we quickly realized these are not necessarily the most effective way to process LHC data, um, right? This is not, an uh, image is not a Lorentz invariant quantity. Um, so you can imagine then sending in particles. So we started sending in four vectors and using um, recursive neural nets or variations on this um, to actually process the data. And that's actually where the current kind of technology is in the LHC of results coming out. Um, but subsequently, uh, we've realized that there have been new developments with graph neural networks. And kind of the next generation of analyses are going to incorporate graph neural networks, with, which allow you not just to take in the collection of particles, but you, now you can imagine to embed the correlations between different particles inside your network. Um, and to give you an idea of the scale of how big an improvement this is, um, just to take this analysis here, this Higgs boson decaying to B quarks. Um, if we look at kind of the 2016 technology, we have um, at a 50% efficiency for a Higgs boson, we have a, a background rejection right here. But when we go to the kind of recursive neural network technology, we're able to reduce our background by a factor of three. Um, and so that's a huge improvement in sensitivity. But now if we had correlations uh, with a graph neural network, right, we can reduce our background by another factor of three. So you're talking about very large background reductions, um, which gives you much more sensitivity. Um, since these kinds of analyses are hidden signals under a huge amount of background. So in light of this, um, we've gotten very excited about um, deep learning. And so far we've really only used it on kind of final state analysis um, with a few exceptions. Um, so we try to, let's say, use a deep, run a deep learning algorithm on these collection of particles. Um, but in light of this, we thought we could kind of embed deep learning deeper into our reconstruction flow, right? So the analysis I showed you, what, what we did is we reconstruct particles kind of with conventional algorithms. And then we take the collection of particles and run a deep learning algorithm on them. But now we're thinking about, let's say, using deep learning to actually reconstruct the particles or even using deep learning to reconstruct the detector hits. And that's really um, kind of the focus of this talk is how we can actually integrate this in. Um, just to give you an idea of kind of the the you know, recent developments, like here's a first actually proposal or first yeah, proposed algorithm that uses the graph neural network to reconstruct all of the particles um, from let's say detector deposits in one swoop, right? This is one network, you can give it the collection of let's say inputs, clusters and tracks and it will link them all together and give you a collection of particles. Um, so it's one algorithm that can look at an event and see it all. Um, in light of this and in light of all the data, um, there's also been some other uh, developments at the LHC. Um, we've done all these great measurements and we still have 15 years of running, um, but we're not gonna increase the energy of the beam very much, right? We're, we're pretty close to our maximum energy. What we are gonna increase is the amount of data, right? We're expecting something like two orders of magnitude more data, um, or as say factor of 50, a large amount of data, factor of 50 more data. And what does this mean? It means that the kind of signals that we're gonna look for are not necessarily the big, you know, giant signals that you would expect to see. These are rare processes, often processes that are hidden under a huge amount of background, right? And to, just to give you an example of a process um, uh, that I've been working on with uh, one of my students, um, here's a process. If you look very deep into this distribution, there's actually a bump here. Uh, and so if you can come up with a strategy to reduce this background by a factor of 100, um, which I did here in the left plot, you actually see there's a nice clean bump and this bump is actually a, a W boson, actually an Z boson. Um, and you can actually use this whole distribution to look for light dark matter, right? So 
Um, the point being is that um, there's a huge amount of data, right? This is hundreds of thousands of, of events per bin. And if you can figure out to reduce this data in a way that will get you a signal, you can actually reduce it by let's say several orders of magnitude and suddenly the signals will start to pop out. Um, and this is kind of the strategy of many of the analyses now at the LHC is not to look for the easy, let's say low hanging fruit, is to look for the, the high hanging fruit um, that's really quite difficult. Um, and just to give you a feel um, of kind of the challenge that we have, uh, if you try to compare the left and the right image, uh, there's a difference. And I'm not gonna give you the time to really find the difference, um, but the difference is here. Uh, this lady on the right is wearing a ring. Uh, and this is the kind of feel that we have, is that we have way too much data and way too much subtlety, and we don't really have time to actually analyze data. Right, here's, here's an equivalent event. Um, uh, a good LHC physicist would look at this and say, oh, um, this just looks like a four jet event. Um, but if you look in detail, actually, you'll see that these jets are coming from displaced particles. Uh, and these are the kind of things that you can't see at first glance in the event. So where are we now? Um, the past 10 years, we've made a number of major discoveries. We've had, uh, we've kind of reformatted the, the way we understand dark matter, at least in the high energy regime. Um, and we're starting to realize that um, deep learning is really, could be very impactful into the quality of physics we're doing. Um, but it also, you know, we have a lot of data and we're trying to look now for kind of harder, harder to find signals and to really kind of understand the finer features of the interactions that are going on. Um, so now I'd like to talk about how we actually process the data and how we can bring deep learning into this processing data. So effectively, how can you think fast? So how do we process the data? Well, we take data at a rate of uh, 320 terabits per second, and we send this directly to a cluster of FPGAs. It's roughly 500 FPGAs. Um, and in this FPGAs, we have about 10 microseconds to decide if the event is interesting. Uh, otherwise, the event gets thrown away. Um, and typically what we do is we do a very quick reconstruction. We just look at the, the event uh, coarsely, and we decide if it's interesting or not. And we're able to select one event in 400 this way. Um, the rest of the events are thrown away forever, right? Lost. Um, and then we send this to a second tier. Um, and so now we've reduced our data rate and our collision rate from 40 megahertz to 100 kilohertz. And we do the same thing, except now we don't use a cluster of FPGAs, we use a cluster of CPUs. Um, and with the CPUs, we have about half a second to decide if the event is interesting. And if it is interesting, uh, we can then select it again, and we eventually keep this event. So we only keep one event in 40,000, right? Uh, the rest of the time, we throw away the events. Um, and so practically speaking, what does this mean from a physics standpoint? Well, typically um, to kind of simplify what the system is doing, it's trying to find the highest energy collisions, right? Um, which can, is not necessarily trivial when you have 70 overlapping collisions. Uh, and so what we tend to keep is the highest energy. And so in our intermediate processing, we have tend to have let's say lower energy collisions. Um, and then with our fast processing, we tend to, we get to analyze everything, even the very low energy. Now, the thing is, thanks to kind of, the data we've had at the LHC over the past 10 years, um, we've come to realize that there might be hidden signals. Um, and there, in fact, there are hidden signals in this lower energy regime that we're just throwing out. Um, so in fact, we know there's good data we're throwing out. So we want to see if we can analyze it, um, thanks to the help of deep learning and say new processing technology. And just to give you an idea of an example, here's a Higgs boson from the same exact analysis. And this Higgs boson actually was just on the cusp of being thrown out, right? So this number here is the energy, 466 GeV. Um, if it was at 450, we would have lost it, right? So it was just on the threshold of being selected. And I can tell you, if we can lower this from this threshold, even from 450 down to 400, you suddenly can double the amount of Higgs bosons you have. And this you know, helps to, let's say, understand the Higgs boson further and, and let's say, further our understanding of deeper understanding of the standard model. So our dream in the end is to see if we can analyze every collision at the LHC. Um, that's our goal. Um, but at the moment we can only analyze, let's say in full detail, one in 40,000. So how do we get there? Well, there's other one, one other thing we have to contend with, which is the fact that uh, we're still continually increasing the beam intensity. And in 2025, we're gonna have a huge increase in beam intensity. And in fact, we're gonna, we're gonna increase the beam and we're gonna increase the number of channels in our detector. 
And so we're going to expect data rates that are an order of a magnitude larger. So not just hundreds of terabits per second. Now we're talking about petabits per second, right, data. Um, and if you look at this in terms of a computing standpoint, uh, it's going to outpace uh, our computing projections um, by a large margin. Um, and this is further hampered because of, let's say, problems in the computing industry. So you guys might all be familiar with Moore's law, right? There's exponential growth uh, with time. Uh, and this is with the number of transistors per processor. So this is what this orange line is. Um, but you might not be familiar with Dinard scaling. Um, so Dinard scaling is the amount of power you can put on your processor. And Dinard scaling stopped in 2005, right? Um, we haven't been able to power this. We can make denser uh, processors, but we can't power it effectively. So what does this mean? It, this is what led to the rise of, let's say, multi-core processors. Um, and more recently, it's been, let's say, pushing us to go into different processing technologies, such as FPGAs and GPUs. So um, how do we handle this uh, with the future upgrades? Are, will we be able to actually deal with the increase in data rates? Can we preserve our physics? Let's just take a look at uh, how we do this. Um, so here, I'm going to look at the first tier of processing. So this is um, FPGA boards. Um, for those of you who don't know what an FPGA is, uh, it stands for field, program, pro field Programmable Gate Array. It's effectively a processor where you can go in the processor and you can actually program uh, all the switches and multiplies in the processor. So you can effectively use the whole processor uh, to do, let's say, any kind of complex computation you want. Uh, and you don't actually just, you know, you don't give it a set of instructions like a normal CPU. You actually give it a, kind of a, a, an architecture, right, that it will uh, configure itself to do so that you can actually process the data. So I want to talk about this, uh, how we can actually bring deep learning into this first tier. Um, and so we did this with a project called HLS for ML. And this is work actually with um, uh, Song An, so who is a professor at MIT, uh, my postdoc, Dylan. Um, and the challenge here was being able to process data uh, in, we wanted to be able to process data in a run a neural network in less than a microsecond. We have 10 microseconds to actually process the data, um, but we only have one, sec uh, one microsecond to actually process the data on a board. Um, and so what does this mean? It means we need to be able to run networks that can run in say very short time scales um, but also we need to be able to run these networks with a, at a frequency of 40 megahertz. Um, and if you look at conventional neural networks, um, this is not really how we can, uh, how neural networks work on processors, right? They tend to run in millisecond timescales or even longer. All right, so let's look at how we actually process a neural network. Um, so here's a typical network. Um, we take an input vector here uh, with two inputs. And then we, to actually, uh, to get it, and we get a single output in the network. Um, and the input vector has two inputs. We multiply it by weights, W1, W2. Uh, and then we add a scalar, and then we apply an activation function. So this is a really simple network. It's just a one layer. And all we're doing is doing a simple multiplication, addition, and activation function. Well, how would you put this on a processor? Well, what you would do is you would split the different applications, uh, and you would like spread them across your processor. So the way you would do this is the first thing you would do is you do your multiplies. And on, the, on a processor, you can do these multiplies in parallel, right? So you can do your weight multiplications in parallel. Um, then you do your addition. Um, so you can do this in a, a separate clock. Uh, and then once you've, let's say, computed your add and multiplication, you can take this uh, value and you can apply your activation function. And we do this on a processor through a lookup table. Well, how does this work? What does this mean? Well, the fact that we spread across the, the different multiplications, additions into separate parts of the processor means that you can actually send a new set of inputs every clock, right? So every time uh, this processing is done with a new clock, you can take in a new set of inputs, right? And so you can continually feed new sets of inputs with every clock. So what does this mean? It means your throughput uh, is one clock. You can send a new set of inputs every clock and your whole neural network will take three clocks to run. Well, three clocks, we typically clock FPGAs in the hundreds of megahertz time scale. So this means this network would run in on the order of 10 or 15 nanoseconds, right? And this is sufficiently fast to actually run this in the first tier of processing at the LHC. 
Um, so we want to take a more realistic benchmark example. We took a, a hadronic jet tagger. So something that will do a similar topology to the Higgs bosons that I showed you. Um, in this case, it's doing W and Z and top quarks. Uh, and then we uh, wrote a compiler that can translate this into uh, FPGAs. Uh, and this spreads the whole network across the processor. Um, and in this case, right, this network has about 4,000 weights. It's a small network. Um, but uh, FPGA has about 4,000 multiplies. And so in fact, we do all the multiplications at the same time, right? So in fact, this whole network, you actually run the network, um, all the multiplications are done at once. And which means you can actually send in a new set of inputs every clock, right? So you can run this, this algorithm at hundreds of megahertz. So here's actually what the network looks like, right? Each of these lines here is a multiply. Um, the total network takes 75 nanoseconds to run. And we can actually feed in a new set of inputs every five nanoseconds, right? So this network is less than a microsecond. Uh, it has an initiation interval less than 40 megahertz, uh, or sorry, higher than 40 megahertz, right? So less than 25 nanoseconds. So we can actually run this at the LHC, right? Um, um, but we'll, to get this to run at the LHC, we actually be, had to be able to fit this network onto the FPGA. And there wasn't actually, uh, completely obvious. Um, the way we had to do this is we had to take our network and we actually had to compress it. Um, also, we had to quantize the multiplications in the network. Um, and then just in case we couldn't still fit it onto this, we wrote our compiler uh, so that you can dynamically change the amount of processor usage you have on the FPGA. Um, so what, is, what do these three things mean? Well, um, in terms of algorithm compression, what we've learned uh, at least with FPGAs, and, and more recently, this has become a, a, a popular field, is that the networks that we tend to design tend to have extra weights, right? They have tend to have too many weights. Um, and most of the weights are zero or close to zero, and they don't actually contribute to your network, your neural network output. So what does this mean? This means you can actually compress your network, right? And here's just an example of a large image network, Re Resonant 56. Um, and you can actually shrink the number of weights on your network or set them to zero. Um, and you still get the same performance, right? So this is this accuracy as a function of compression. And what we found is that you can actually compress our, our network here that does uh, hadronic jet tagging by a factor of 10. And you don't even change the performance, right? It's within kind of the thickness of this line. Uh, and so we were able to shrink our network uh, substantially and then embed zero impression on our processor so we can actually run this much faster. Um, what else did we do? Well, the other thing you find with networks is that you know, we tend to train our neural networks at 32-bit floating point precision, but it turns out that this is a little uh, kind of, this can be a huge waste of resources. Um, and just to take our hadronic jet tiger, right? This is the performance if you vary the bit precision, right? So here's 32 bits. And you can shrink the bit precision all the way down to 13 bits and you get exactly the same performance, right? So you don't actually need to make neural networks that run with full bit precision. And this allows us, it allows you to effectively use processors much, much better. I mean, and this applies to FPGAs, but it also applies to other processors like GPUs um, and ASICs. Um, more recently, we've actually investigated this further and you can actually improve this even more by actually embedding the quantization in the training. So in fact, if you train with a, a, quantized, uh, a quantized network, right? So you actually embed this quantization, you can actually improve, go down to even smaller bits, right? So this is actually the same, it's the same network as this one. And you see it dropped off at 13 bits before, right? When we just quantized it after we trained it. But if we embed the quantization in the training, we can actually make this network only you know, five or six bits and have the same performance, right? Um, and this is a huge decrease in resources, right? Um, you know, I recall that we're multiplying numbers here. Um, so if you shrink the bits uh, on both numbers, right, this is actually an, an N squared problem. You can actually shrink the area on your processor by the bit precision squared, right? So it's a real huge improvement. Um, so I won't go into more details about our tool, but we've now developed a, this tool, HLS for Mel. It can take a kind of conventional neural network from Keras or PyTorch or TensorFlow, um, and it will convert it to FPGA uh, synthesizable code. And in fact, we can also use this for other types of processors, such as ASICs, where you actually hard code um, the 
you hard code the algorithm on the processor and you can't change it afterwards. Um, we have, you know, I showed you a, just a, a multi-layer perceptron, but um, we have a broad range of network architectures and we've been working to expand this um, to many different properties. Um, so you can ask me about that later. Now, what is it done for the LHC? Um, so let me just give you a few examples. It's actually gonna be run in LHC run three. So starting in a year. Um, and the left here is an example for a Higgs boson tiger. Uh, so if we just look at a fixed rate uh, with kind of a cut based approach, we would get this um, kind of, this would be our best performance, this uh, Swiss cross, right? Um, just to pick a point, this is at 75 kilohertz. Um, if we then use a deep neural network to identify Higgs bosons, right? We can go from this Swiss cross, we can improve our signal efficiency by something like a factor of more than 50%, right? The same rate. Um, so, so it really does make a big difference to have these networks. And this is something, you, this network you can very easily fit on an FPGA into our system. Um, to give you another example, um, here's an example actually that a, a year up uh, and my postdoc Dylan um, put together. So, so here's a, a, the idea here is to identify tau leptons. So tau lepton is heavy lepton. Uh, and kind of the conventional approach that we had before was this black line. So this is the rate uh, for a sp specific tau lepton efficiency uh, as a function of the energy of the tau, right? And this is the spectrum, it's false. Um, if you apply a neural network and you tune the neural network to be the same efficiency, you can go from this black line down to this cyan line, right? So you can actually reduce the rate by an order of magnitude. Well, what does this mean? It means, well, if you want to look for Higgs bosons that have an energy of 60 GeV, um, you'd have to, you know, run these at a very large rate. So, you know, megahertz, thousand kilohertz, which is something you can't do. But if you do this uh, with a neural network on your FPGA, you can now run it in a reasonable amount of time, right? Um, the more deeper thing though, that we stumbled on, right? When we were trying to solve a problem for the LHC, uh, but we, we realized that we actually had walked into territory that was not very well explored in terms of how you program uh, neural networks on a processor. So kind of conventional approaches, um, both on GPUs and FPGAs, it, the strategy is to build a giant flexible layer, right? So you have this layer, and let's say you wanna run a CNN, this layer can run a CNN. Let's say you wanna run just a, a dense layer, right? This layer can run a dense network. Um, and, you know, let's say you wanna run something more exotic, you know, like recursive neural network, um, this layer will, will be programmed to do that. and. The idea then is that you can send inputs. And let's say you have a 50 layer network. You send in your inputs, you run that layer, you take your outputs, you send in your, you send your inputs to the next layer and you just keep iterating layer, 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 layer. Um, and that's kind of where industry has developed. Um, the advantage of this is that you can make very large networks, right? Uh, you, can have, you can have one layer just do a hundred, one big flexible layer can run a hundred iterations of, 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 a, of a neural network that's a hundred layers. Right, so you can run a very large network, um, and it, it's effectively a way to to run large neural networks, which which kind of has been the focus of industry, where they have networks that are millions of weights, and these days are billions of weights. Um, but in our case, what we did was we actually used the processor uh, to co encode firmware for each layer. Right, so we actually program directly uh, firmware for a single layer, we program directly firmware for our next layer, and then we have many layers and they're all unrolled onto our processor. So each part of, so, you know, when you have a processor, each region of the processor will be doing a different part of that neural network, right? Um, and people had not really explored this region, um, mostly because it's, in some sense, it's a waste of resources, right? You know, instead of having one layer, firmware for one layer, you have firmware for N layers, um, but this thing has a huge advantage in if you want to run things really fast, because now you can run multiple layers at the same time. You can just start piping data through. Um, and we needed this for LHC processing, um, but it turns out that there's actually many other things that we might need it for. And that's what I'll talk about in the next, let's say, 10 minutes of this talk. Um, just as a note, right, um, kind of, you know, why do you still get such good throughput with GPUs um, or FPGAs? And GPU is a good example because what they'll do is often clone the layer code many times. Um, so if you want to run a thousand things, right, you parallelize this thing a thousand times, 
um, you can run your neural network, you know, a thousand times on separate parts of your GPU, right? So it makes it easy to massively parallelize this network. Um, but, you know, if, if you're trying to unroll your network, right, you, you're, you're doing things in a different paradigm. Right? So now let me talk a little bit about how we process data and longer latencies. Um, and so this is work actually, uh, a lot of this work has been done by um, my student, Jeffrey Krupa, and my postdoc, Dylan. Um, and I'm going to talk about the second and third tiers of processing at the LHC. Um, and at the moment, these are conventional CPU clusters. Um, one does a fast reconstruction, one does a slow reconstruction. And we wanted to see, let's say, how FPGAs and GPUs kind of could be interfaced in this. So we did a first test um, where we tried to discriminate top quarks from uh, background jets. And we did this using just um, CNN architecture. So we made a jet image. Um, and we use this giant ResNet 50 architecture. So with that, we were able to train a network that could separate top quarks and background jets. And we we're able to get pretty close to like the world leading um, best tagger. Um, so we were within, you know, within the uncertainty of the data set um, uh, with the best tagger. And so we made it like what we thought was a good network. Um, and so then we ran it uh, on a CPU and it takes about two seconds or a little bit less than two seconds per event. Uh, and then when we ran it on an FPGA, uh, so we chose Resident 50 because we had an FPGA implementation of this, uh, we were able to run this a thousand times faster, right? Um, and so this is a huge improvement. Uh, and also if you run this on a GPU, at least at the time when we did these studies, um, we were able to get it to be close to the FPGA uh, once we batched the GPU. Um, subsequently, newer GPUs have actually beaten the FPGA um, by a bit. Um, so the, the newer numbers are even faster. Well, what does this mean? Um, when we saw a factor of a thousand improvement, it means that we had to redesign the way we could process data. Um, conventionally, we've been just distributing things across CPUs, right, and processing everything in parallel. But now if we can put dedicated algorithms on FPGAs or GPUs, we can have them serve many CPUs, um, but just one run one algorithm really fast. Um, and if it's a thousand times faster than a CPU, you can have you know, your, your coprocessor, your FPGA or GPU serve all of these CPUs at once, right? So we wanted to see if we could actually do this at the scale of the LHC. Um, and so we, we started to, let's say, rewrite our processing code. And so at the LHC, we typically take an input, we have an algorithm and an output. And so in this case, what we do is we offload the algorithm to a processor, a GPU or an FPGA. Uh, and then we, we like send it back to the output. And we actually, we have this communicate over network, right, between the two. Um, so you, you lose some latency in, in terms of sending things to your processor, but then you gain by the fact that the algorithm is so much faster. Now, the other thing we can do uh, is that we actually have very good scheduling for our uh, software in the LHC. So we can actually run multiple events at the same time. So while you're waiting, right, for your request to come back, you can start on the next event. Um, and so you can effectively pack in your processing on the CPU and take advantage of the speed up that you get from GPUs and FPGAs. Um, so this gives you a huge reduction in latency. Um, so let's just take a look. Um, so we made a framework that does this, we call it Sonic. Um, and we also made a server framework. Um, so for FPGAs, we wrote our own, uh, we call it FAST. Uh, and then um, for the GPUs, we actually use a kind of the industry standard, which is the Triton inference server. And we made it such that our protocols um, between the GPU and FPGA are, are the same. So it, you can kind of switch between whatever processor you have um, seamlessly. So we took a simple example. Um, and this example is uh, Hadron Calorimeter Reconstruction. The reason we took this example is that it's the single uh, largest process currently in the high-level trigger in, in CMS. It takes 10% of the full high-level trigger. And the idea here is that you need to uh, reconstruct the energy of 16,000 channels. Um, so first thing we did is we made a very simple neural network um, that can take the inputs and output the energy. Uh, and we were able to get this to actually perform a little bit better than the nominal algorithm. Um, and we just, it's a very simple network. And so then we wanted to see how much we could speed it up. Well, if we look at the nominal algorithm on the 16,000 channels, it takes 60 milliseconds. Um, if we do this um, neural network on, we call it facile, on two on a GPU, it's 30 times faster. If we do it on an FPGA, it's uh, 600 times faster. 
right? So now we wanted to see if we could run our high level trigger with this new algorithm um, under this new paradigm. And so here is an example. Um, so here's an example on a GPU. Um, and what you can see is that, um, so the x-axis here is the number of HLT processes that we're running. So in this case, we're running, in the case of 300, we're running 300 HLT um, cores, right? So this is the HLT processor node. Uh, and, and each one of these is communicating to a single GPU. And this GPU is running our HCAL reconstruction for all, let's say, 300 simultaneous processes. Uh, and so what we saw when we did this, when we offloaded it, is that we were able to get a 10% reduction in the processing time. Well, what does this mean? It means that, well, we this algorithm was taking 10% of the time. We sped it up by a factor of 30. And now we can actually, let's say, recover this additional 10% time um, for free. And we can have one GPU serve 300. And in fact, uh, I think it's more like 400 HLT nodes, right? Um, so one processor replaces 10% of 400, right? Um, and just to be clear, right, this is just one algorithm, right? The, the high-level trigger in, in, in CMS consists of about 20 algorithms. Um, well, it's maybe even more, but let's say 20 blocks of algorithms. And so if we're able to, let's say, accelerate all of these, you can imagine very large improvements in your processing. Now, um, we did this on GPUs. We also did this on FPGAs. And here's actually the performance on FPGAs. We're able to go from, let's say, 400 parallel processings. So this is 400 here. It's uh, not even on our axis. We're able to go all the way up to 1,500, right? So the FPGA was significantly faster. And we still preserve our 10% reduction, right, in the total processing time of the high-level trigger. Um, and then what we see is that, you know, things start to slow down after 1,500 cores. It turns out that the reason this slowed down was not because of the FPGA. It was actually because we did this on Amazon. Uh, Amazon has an FPG FPGAs on them, and they have a 25 gigabit per second limit uh, into their FPGAs. Um, but we knew we could actually run this at 100 gigabits per second. And so, you know, if you did a full throughput test, right, we actually found that you could do 5,500 5, simultaneous HLT processing served by one FPGA, right? So that means that you can reduce your whole system of 5,000, let's say, cores um, by 10% with just one FPGA, right? So 500 to one ratio. So, um, you know, this is just a glimpse of kind of the way you could change computing um, in the high level trigger at the LHC. And the point that we're seeing is that, you know, all these tools that we developed to process things really fast at our first tier can actually be propagated to the various other computing tiers uh, and give very large speed ups. Now, I won't go through the other algorithms, but we've, we're starting to, let's say, explore many different algorithms. Um, and we're thinking really about how we can actually kind of change the whole paradigm of how we process data at the LHC. Um, I'd like to talk about one more experimental thing that involves LHC processing. And so in this case, what we did um, was we add accelerators, but now I want to zoom in on this region between our first tier of processing, where it's FPGA boards, and our second tier, which is CPUs. And I want to ask, what if we made a different system, right? What if we were to make an FPGA uh, act as an in-between with our, an FPGA accelerator, act as an in-between with our first system and our second system? Well, this would allow us to actually throttle kind of the rate, data rate that we take. Right, so you can actually take data at much higher rates in principle and build kind of a tiered uh, system that will throttle down to your CPU cluster. This effectively means you can process more information in your system, right? It's a different paradigm. And so this led us to a development we call Aegean that I did with uh, these guys at University of Toronto. And the idea here was to merge the idea of HLS formal, where we um, use a lot of resources but make networks really fast, with an inter-processor uh, protocol called Galapagos that aims to connect um, disparate uh, processors. So you can imagine having a, a cluster with a CPU, an FPGA, and a GPU, and having them all communicate with one single protocol. Um, and so we decided to combine these. And what came out of this was a, 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 a software called Aegean that allows you to, let's say, unroll networks across many FPGAs. So what does this mean? It means you can now take your, your, a group of FPGAs and you can turn them into one super processor, right? 
where you have a giant network and you've made firmware, you've programmed each processor to do specific part of the network, right? Um, and the nice thing is that between FPGAs, you can get very fast communication. Uh, and so you can run networks at incredibly fast rates. Um, so we did a few examples. So here's an example to do anomaly detection uh, at the LHC. So it's uh, it just looks for anomalies in the data and takes in a whole of those. And let's say on one GPU, if you were to run this, it takes 2.5 milliseconds uh, per event. Um, if you were to just take this uh, algorithm and run it just on one FPGA with HLS for ML, um, it would take about 260 microseconds. So this is a, a fairly large network. It's about half a million weights, right? So it's not, it's not like a very tiny network. Um, but if we were to take this network and then unroll it across three FPGAs, um, you can get an improvement that's less than a third. Um, so you can actually use your resources better across the three FPGAs. Um, but more importantly, you can actually just feed in data at a rate of 2.8 microseconds, right? So what does this mean? This is almost at a rate of a megahertz, right? So you can actually take this tier and process data at a rate that's close to a megahertz, right? And you can, this gives you a new paradigm for how you process data. Um, and just to make sure that we could kind of scale this up, we actually have an implementation of ResNet 50, which is a 25 million weight, uh, 50 layer network. We've actually distributed this across nine uh, relatively small FPGAs. Um, in fact, if we packed it tightly, we could actually fit this network on two FPGAs. Um, and, and, and this is actually with the target. So we, we targeted a luminosity that was um, similar to a, a previous, let's say, FPGA implementation of ResNet 50, which is a Microsoft Brainwave, which is actually where we started our studies. With. So we wanted to be able to do a, a throughput that was better than theirs. Um, they interestingly also have a similar setup where they have an integrated cluster of FPGAs that can communicate with each other. Um, the big difference is ours is open source and ours um, has a lot of flexibility in how you can program the neural network. So this kind of gives us a new paradigm of how you can process computing. Um, you don't need to think of a network, uh, a neural network as you know, loading it onto one processor. You can think about it as distributing it across many processors. Um, and so you can think about doing ultra high throughput systems, right? That are really fast and really effective. Um, and there's lots of room to explore. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about some other applications. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about all of them, um, but there's, I'll talk about some, some work that we've been doing at MIT. And the idea here is to actually use uh, deep learning to do multi-messenger multi astronomy. And so the idea is quite simple. Um, let's say you have a, an event in LIGO, it comes from a, let's say a neutron star merger. You might have a, an electromagnetic component of this um, that will come after the gravitational waves. You know, imagine like gamma ray bursts or you know, some, some merger. And so you want to then point your telescopes uh, in the direction of where your uh, gravitational wave event happened. Um, so the idea then is to be able to identify um, the gravitational wave event very quickly, and then be able to communicate with the telescopes so that they can actually look and point in that direction. Um, and so this is a work done actually with um, Tri Nguyen, who's a student here, and then um, Alec, he's a, a researcher in our group, and, and Eric Katsavanudis. Um, so the real scheme here is to really see how fast we can alert uh, various detectors uh, given a gravitational wave signal. So what do gravitational wave signals look like? There's some sort of oscillations um, and there's a variety of different oscillations. Um, and the kind of time scales for these oscillations that you start to see them is on the order of hundred milliseconds, right? So you'll start to see a signal with about hundred millisecond time scale. Um, and then once you have your signal, you have you know, arsenal of telescopes that are waiting um, to look at the signal and see if you can do a, a correlated multi-messenger event. Um, and to give you an idea of how this would work, well, here's a reconstruction uh, with three different detectors, right? So three different gravitational wave detectors. And if you take these signals, you can then con construct a, for each of them, you can construct a vector uh, for where the gravitational wave event occurred, right? And the distance. Uh, and this allows you to point in a direction. It's not great, but you can at least point in some direction to, to see where your astrophysical signal went. Um, so then how do you do this fast, right? So these current kind of conventional tools um, to really do a good denoising and to process the data, you're, you're talking about 
seconds to minutes of time to actually process the data. Um, and this is enough time that you might actually lose the, the electromagnetic component of the event. Uh, you might not see it. Um, so you wanna do this as fast as you possibly can. So how do you do this fast? Well, here's just a, a typical, let's say raw data signal. Um, so this is what it looks like. The first thing you have to do is clean it, right? So if you clean this data and then you look, you see a signal here. This is actually the first gravitational wave event um, that we observed. And then you wanna zoom in on the signal and get the properties so that you can actually get, let's say a vector to point um, where it happened. So the idea, the strategy here is to come up with a deep learning approach to kind of do the whole chain. Um, and so there's a first approach here. Uh, this is a, a work actually led by uh, Tri Nguyen, who's a student here at MIT. Um, and he made an autoencoder that can actually denoise the gravitational wave input um, and allows you to get a kind of a clean signal. So something that's, that's you know, cleaned up. So it goes from this raw step to the clean step. Uh, and this is, it's a relatively simple neural network. And so it's the kind of thing we could think about running in real time. Um, and just to give you an idea of the performance, it performs uh, just as well as, let's say, kind of more conventional methods. And in fact, there's room for exploration because you can actually get nonlinear, you can correct for nonlinear cor correlations with noise sources. Um, and here's an example of a neural network that can actually identify, let's say, the gravitational waveform. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, this network can actually identify glitches, which happen all the time uh, at LIGO. And so you, they get a very low score. Your background gets kind of an intermediate score. And then your uh, black holes, you can get a pretty clean separation. Now, if you put all of this together, you can actually run this. Um, we've actually been able to, let's say, place this on um, GPUs. And so here's actually a two GPU system where we've actually taken these individual algorithms and placed them on the processors. And we can actually run this algorithm really fast. Um, so here's a X, the Y axis here is in microseconds. So this is a four millisecond time scale, right? Um, and so you can run, let's say the, well, this is the first, the first part of this is just actually taking in the inputs and then you can actually run the algorithm. The, the deep cleaning algorithm takes about a millisecond and the binary black hole detection takes also about a millisecond. So you can run this whole thing in just a few milliseconds, right? Um, and so what does this mean? You can actually take this, let's say two GPU setup, link it directly to your LIGO detector um, or both LIGO detectors and just start processing the data real time. Um, and you can get alerts. Um, and you know, just to, to put a scale on this, right? The GPU, um, it takes about half a millisecond to run this. We actually made an FPGA version um, just to see how fast we could run it. And like a first version takes, let's say, 100 microseconds, but we could actually make these even faster, right? So the point being is that um, when you have your gravitational wave signal, basically once you start to see something significant, you can almost immediately identify it and, and start to get properties for it. Um, so there's all sorts of other topics we've been exploring with the fast machine learning. Um, so there's uh, been research with neutrinos, with the protodyne detector, accelerator controls, um, work with um, material science, such as with this um, piezo response uh, force microscopy, as well as with um, kind of the broader machine learning group. Um, a lot of this work fits under the tiny machine learning um, subfield. Um, there's all sorts of experiments. You can ask me about them. Um, and then I'd like to highlight that a lot of this work has been done in a larger collaboration. Uh, we call ourselves the Fast Machine Learning Collaboration, um, FML. Um, and uh, you can go to this website and learn. Um, but we're now a group of more than, let's say, 40 members of 10 institutes uh, actively working on this. So I'd like to use the last 10 minutes or so of my talk uh, to talk about uh, something that started at the IFI um, collaboration. And it actually started in 2019 at the CTP when we're having meetings to prepare um, to build the IFI proposal. Um, and after one of the meetings, I was chatting with Fiala and she was telling me about all the uh, incredible stuff she's been doing with normalizing flows. Uh, and it got me thinking because I was stuck on a problem. Um, I wanted to come up with a way to measure all Higgs boson decays uh, in one fell swoop. Um, so the idea here was that, let's say you had a Higgs boson and it has a high enough energy that it, all its products decay in a cone. Um, I wanted to come up with a strategy uh, to actually, independent of what it decayed to, claim that this cone was a Higgs boson, right? 
Um, and so there's some difficulties here because the Higgs could decay to part invisible particles you wouldn't see. Um, but there are some constraints you have, like the mass of the Higgs. Um, you can also, if the Higgs has a high energy, which you can, can measure by, let's say, recoiling objects, um, you can actually constrain the region where its decays would be. And my thought was that maybe there's a deep learning strategy that can kind of look at all the decays at once. Um, and so Fiala's work about kind of embedding physics into normalizing flow algorithms was very inspiring. Um, and this led to kind of uh, an idea that I want to present in the next few slides. Um, just as a, a reference, right, analyses at the LHC um, have gotten more complex in the past 10 years. So here's a Higgs discovery. Um, one of the Higgs discovery plots is just a one category plot. You can see the Higgs boson. But these days when we look at the Higgs, we actually tend to look at it in many more categories. So the, the current incantation has 103 different categories. Um, this is kind of the, the official way you split the Higgs. And this is in not just with decay modes, right? This is just for one Higgs decay mode, right? So you can multiply this by the five kind of conventional decay modes that we look at. Um, so you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of categories. Um, and this has been kind of true for all analyses at the LHC. Um, we've gone from kind of simple analyses to many categories, complex fits. Um, when I did Higgs to Tau Tau, uh, we actually did the fit, the actual analysis looked for the Higgs in 72 different categories. And the fit had actually about um, 2,500 um, uh, nuisance parameters that you floated. Uh, and so it actually, the fit took about 24 hours. Um, it, was, it was very nerve wracking um, to do this. Um, but these days, even that kind of fit, you can run relatively quickly. I think you can run it in less than an hour now, um, thanks to the power of computing. Um, but also, you know, thanks to the fact that we have such good understanding of our collisions, we can do these complex analyses. Um, so I think there's a general trend, um, you know, at the LHC to start thinking about doing analyses, not just, you know, for a single process, but do many all in one swoop. Um, and just to give you an example, right, here's an analysis um, where they looked at basically a broad range of decays, uh, order of 500 different categories of processes. Um, and they were able to use, look at all 500 and compute a chi-square for how well the standard model predicts these processes. Um, and unfortunately, the standard model predicts it quite well. Um, but this is kind of a, a broader trend of things that we're seeing at the LHC in terms of analysis. Um, so talking to Fiala, she got me excited about the latent space. So what is the latent space? Well, let's say you train an autoencoder. So you have an input digit is you send some input object, like a digit, and you want to get the out an output object that's the same thing. And you try to squeeze uh, the inputs into a lower dimensional space that kind of captures all of the features that you want to the physical features that you want to en that encapsulate the object, right? So if you want to train for digits, um, this would be a, a space that can actually, let's say, reconstruct digits. So in some region, you might have the digit nine, and you wouldn't be surprised that digit seven is not so far away because it's often pretty hard to distinguish these. Um, and so a neural network will construct an ordered latent space. Um, and this can allow you to kind of embed um, complex processes into a lower dimensional space. Um, and this is a very natural way to take like a, a physics objects and then embed them into a lower dimensional space, like the standard model, and then use this space to really kind of look at differences. Um, and so, you know, thanks to a lot of work with normalizing flows, um, you can actually capture very complex spaces, right? They don't have to be linear um, and you can embed this in your latent space. Um, but sometimes, right, what comes out of the latent space can be a mystery. Um, so in light of this, I wanted to explore the latent space for what we call one-shot learning. And the idea here is to, to actually build a network that can look at not just one thing, but can look at a lot of things and say they're all similar, right? And it doesn't need to be trained. So you can imagine training a network to identify uh, this handsome guy on the left. Um, but then when this guy goes on a, a skateboard, um, your network would actually, even though he, the, the network had never seen this image, the network would understand that this image is actually quite similar. Um, and the strategy here is that, well, this, this guy would live in one part of the latent space, and this other guy would live in another region of the latent space that's not so far away, right? So, so they're quite similar. Um, and you know, the advantage of using a normalizing flow here is that you can embed, it's a better way to embed the physics into the space. 
Um, so in light of this, we decided to do a little competition uh, and join the LHC Olympics. Uh, so, and the strategy here was to look for a signal, a mysterious signal that was hidden in the data that none of us actually knew. Um, and so this is, uh, and so they, they hit a signal that's actually this complex signal and it's hidden in the data. Now, typically the way people have looked for anomalous signals in the data is kind of through two strategies. So um, first with a strategy called uh, that, that's been developed actually partly here at MIT called classification without labels. So it's actually a work that uh, Jesse and his group has done. And the strategy here is to play one region of the data against another region of the data, right? So one region might be very similar. Region A will be similar to region B, but region B might have a hidden signal in this. So what you can do is you can train a neural network to identify the differences in this. And if there's a hidden signal, this difference should pop out. Um, the other approach is kind of more conventional, which is to use an autoencoder, right? So you have something that can generate, um, you know, take data inputs and then generate objects, uh, standard model objects. And then what you want to do is look for an anomaly, right? And the autoencoder can allow you to look for an anomalous feature because um, you just look for things that, that the autoencoder cannot generate. It's not in its space of knowledge, right? Um, now, each of these have advantages. Um, so the advantage of this uh, weak supervision, where you train one region against the other, is that if you do have a signal there, it's very powerful, right? The signal is statistically significant. Um, you can identify it quite well. Um, the autoencoder, well, you're embedding your knowledge of how, let's say, interactions happen, right? So if you look at your space, you you have this, you know, prerequisite knowledge of how interactions happen. Um, and so what you can do is, if the signal is very small, you can actually start to see it. Um, thanks to the fact that you've kind of embedded this knowledge into your network. Um, so my thought was to embed more knowledge into the network and to use this concept from, let's say, one-shot learning to basically tell the network what signals should look like, right, roughly speaking. Um, and so we made a, a, an algorithm we call Quack, which effectively builds on the autoencoder approach, um, but it could also be integrated, you know, with these weak supervision approaches. Um, and this is, this is work with um, my student, Sanyan. Um, and so the idea here is to build a normalizing flow um, for signals. Um, so an autoencoder for signals and an autoencoder for background. And so backgrounds will not look like signals. So they'll have uh, high anomalous signal features, but low background. Um, signals, on the other hand, will be in the opposite space, right? They'll be very signal-like, so low signal um, and not background. Anomalous features like detector glitches, um, they won't fit in either the signal space or the background space, right? So this, they live farther away. Now, um, you have to assume, make some assumption about your signals. So we made some, insert some prior. Um, so if your signal is a little bit different, well, the hope is that it will be close enough in your space to your hypothetical signal that you can actually identify. So you're injecting some biases but you also are able to remove anomalies. Um, and these autoencoders tend to, you know, kind of flag anomalies and, you know, what would be a hypothetical new signal just as, as equally as anomalous, right? Um, so then we can search in this space. Um, and so we then made a space and, and we actually, in, in kind of the interest of, of LHC of fitting all the categories at once, um, we made a 25 category fit and we looked for the signal. Um, so this is the quack space. Um, so we call this approach doc, doc goose. And you can go from uh, backgrounds. This is the, the LHC Olympics. This is their hidden signal is hidden somewhere in here. And we were able to go from this to this and you can see a very clear signal um, just by looking in the anomalous space for something that is signal-like. Um, and we were able to quote a significance of something like six sigma. And I think this is the largest uh, quota significance that we saw in the LHC Olympics. There were some other very interesting approaches. But more importantly, um, why did we do this? Well, well, we realized that the normalizing flow approach, um, embedding signals in this latent space, you can actually capture the same kind of features that you can get from a supervised learning. Um, so if we actually took a signal and we made a quack space, um, and then we compared this to, uh, and we tried to look at the separation against background. We found that quack space um, look, worked just as well as a supervised network, right? You can actually get the same performance, if not even a little bit better. And what's happening is that your, your latent space is actually organizing the physics in a way that allows you to separate out signal background. 
The big advantage of this is that now if you go to spaces that are different, so imagine you, you train your quack space on a single signal, but you want to look, let's say, for a different kind of signal, like a, a three prong, um, the performance stays the same. So these solid lines are different performances with one quack algorithm uh, and different signal models. Um, if you tried to do supervised training, you would get these dashed lines, right? So it would work on the same model. That's what this red dashed line is. But if you use a different model, um, it quickly, the performance qu quickly degrades to nothing. So the strategy here is the latent space embeds your physics. Um, so is this all, I'd like to think this is a harbinger of, of how we might do analyses in the future. I can look at something and just ask it to look broadly speaking for Higgs bosons or anything that looks like a Higgs boson. Um, or you know something else, right? Um, maybe there's a, something else hidden in the data. Um, and then you know the deeper question is, can we do this in real time? Um, so in summary, uh, deep learning and real time deep learning is opening the field to many new and exciting things. Uh, so thank you. Wonderful. Phil, thank you very much for the wonderful colloquium. Everyone out there, join me in clapping for Phil. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand and I will unmute you. All right, well, maybe while they're coming in, I'll just ask a quick question. So I, I, I liked the, uh, the, the uh, last bit here at the end. I think I missed the crucial aspect where the normalizing flows came in though and why that was advantageous. Can you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't spend too much time on this. Um, yeah. So the normalizing flow. So um, if you make an auto encoder, um, so right, there's kind of three tiers of auto encoders. Um, there's auto encoder, variational auto encoder and normalizing flow. Yes. Um, so, uh, an autoencoder, what it will do is try to build a latent space um, to reconstruct this, the inputs as the outputs. Um, the problem is that uh, a normal autoencoder, this latent space can be discontinuous. You could have like six, you know, if you're trying to do digits, you could have six here and six in like another corner, and you could move off that space. Um, variational autoencoders kind of resolve this issue. Um, so, so it kind of forces things in the, the space to be organized. Um, the, the thing about the normalizing flow is that if your space, for example, is not uh, linear. So let's say you have um, objects that have, let's say, weird correlations. Um, the normalizing flow will transform the space uh, to a space that is linear, um, that you can kind of embed your physics knowledge in, a, in, in this, let's say, abstract latent space in a linear way. And then you can transform it back, right? Um, so like in the case of like, you know, Fiala's work, right? <coughs> She uses the, the, the normalizing flows to kind of um, uh, transform from you know these higher dimensional say gauge groups into a, a space that that kind of captures you know the physics that she cares about and then she transforms back right yeah absolutely um, yeah so, so so basically I think you're saying that with the normalizing flows similar to her case the, the details of it basically make the latent space better behaved and that compared to a simple auto auto encoder where sort of the, where things end up in the latent space, it could sort of be all over the place. Uh, the details of the normalizing flows just lead to better behavior. That's right, that's right. Um, I mean, you know, there, there's some details about what normalizing flow is best and these kinds of things, but practically speaking is that it, it, it makes your latent space like better behave. Very good. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good, so a question is here from Jesse and then Seb has one. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, and the, the speedups that you're getting on, on deployment are really impressive. Um, I, I'm curious, have you thought anything about ways that we might speed up training? Um, because there's certainly contexts where we might want to use machine learning where the amount of time that I want to spend on training uh, is actually the bottleneck more so than the, than the deployment. Um, are there any uh, opportunities that you see on the training side to make things faster? Uh, yeah, so training is much harder. Um... So, so the, the thing about training is that the way you speed it up on a processor is you put more memory onto your processor. Um, so there are kind of, there are people in industry who are building like new types of processors that have huge amounts of memory. Um, so there are ways to speed it up by redesigning the processor. Um, in terms of 
like how you could kind of make a new paradigm for training. Like, you know, we thought about this at FPGAs, but it's very hard because training, uh, FPGAs are tend to be fixed precision and training with fixed precision is very hard. Um, like, like even when we do fixed precision training, there's actually like floating point layers in between um, that you then kind of remove. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, like in terms of kind of the training solutions I've seen where people speed up training these days is either like new types of processor technology or just build a larger system. Um, yeah, I, I can't say more than that. I mean, it's, it's never been a bottleneck for us, um, mostly because, you know, the, we're trying to just process huge amounts of data. Um, right. And so the training tends to go on in, in, in the background. Um, Right, thanks. I mean, what I can say for reinforcement learning, there are ways to do it very fast. Um, so if you're thinking along those lines, you can like you can do kind of small updates relatively fast. All right, Seb. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I've got a question similar to the one that Isabel Goose asked in the chat, which was about what is considered interesting versus not. And in particular, I assume that the FPGA indeed was just done for inference. I don't understand what was the training signal and how did you, yeah, how did you train the network that you put on the FPGA? What was the loss? Oh, I mean, you know, it depends on the problem, right? The loss is different for every one of these problems. Um, so if I just pick this, this first network I did, um, this jet one, um, the loss here is just a category across entropy and you're just trying to discriminate. Um, and the training was done on a GPU. Uh, it's, it's a small network, right? It, it train, you can train it in like a minute. Um, okay. And I, I was just going to add one more comment about the, uh, accelerating training on FPGS that's regarding Jesse's question. I, I would worry that on a, what the FPGA gives you acceleration because you can physically lay out your network on the FPGA and then you get like every single DSP and every single uh, lookup table is used at every single clock time. But to do training, you need to be able to do forward and backward. And I think that would, that would not be necessarily possible with an FPGA because the backward prevents you from using it forward, if you see what I mean. No, so, so the way you would do it, right? Um, yeah, we thought about this, right? Is you can actually do that, right? You can you can have a backward network and a forward network. And you, you okay, have so you should duplicate it. And then you, the, 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 the thing that's confusing is how you share the weights between the two yeah. networks, right? Um, so it, it, in that sense, you can do it, right? It's on If you're on the same processor, you're, you can actually point to the same uh, or, or a collection of memory addresses and you can cycle it through. Um, that's certainly a possibility, but there's a more fundamental issue that fixed precision training is just not very effective, right? Um, like you have to, you have to be able to dynamically change the precisions um, to really get good performance. I mean, you can, you can get something to work, right? You can do a small like reinforcement learning things, but you can't like, if you want to do a, a large network and do the whole thing on FPGA, I, I, I haven't, I mean, I've seen people with implementations, but I've never seen like somebody definitively claim this is a, a better solution. Um, there are better solutions with special processors that have huge amounts of memory, right? And they, they just, you know, it, you can solve, it's, you do the same scheme, right? Um, but, you know, once you have huge amount of memory and, and it, the memory is fast, right? It, it makes it a lot easier. All right, are there any other questions for Phil? All right, well, in that case, uh, Phil, thank you very much. Everyone, let's give Phil one more round of applause. Uh, it was great to hear from you and uh, your talk will be posted on YouTube uh, rather quickly and edited later in the day. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice afternoon, everyone. Thanks.